I already did. Perfect. But I'll say it again. That's great. Perfect. Let me know yeah, like we're good. We're on. So this lecture is going to be online with the video, with the audio and the video. So it'll be on our website. So you can take notes. You don't have to take notes. And really, it's more, I'm here to answer your questions, but I'm going to go through different things. But stop me. Um, if you want, I will say in advance, thank you to two things. First, for being guinea pigs. This Ask the Audience is something that I developed. I have some talks to give later in the year. And we're going to see how it goes. So for those that want to participate, it would be great if you can. Just get on your smartphone, your iPhone, whatever. Second one is I want to, again, thank Kim from Abbott for sponsoring this. It's great. Thank you so much. So cheers to SIVA and Propaflow. Does anyone need this up anymore to get into this? Does anyone have any problems with how to get in? Is this what it's supposed to look like before you start? Keep uh, going. It should be... Go to next. Oh. <laughs> yeah, scroll down and no, go no. to next. Yeah, it's going, it's going, it's just slow. And then you'll have a practice. There's one practice question. Okay. Or just an example question, but we're going to go ahead and get started on this. And stop me if you have any questions. I usually do this, I go through the outline to let you know what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about the disease of hyperthyroidism. Then I'm going to talk about diagnostics because a lot of people call up and have questions. Well, what test should I do? What's really... So I'm going to lay it out in terms of what each test is about and what really is the optimal path of going down for these, for uh, confirming hyperthyroidism on these guys. And well, I won't, I won't talk about it now. I'll move on to it. And then we're going to go on to associations, which in going through preparing this talk, there are some interesting associations between hyperthyroidism and other things that you will see. And then we're going to talk about treatments, methimazole, I-131, other treatments, including there's a printout um, for those that, whose owners asked them about homeopathic stuff at uh, ACVIM. They had a list of homeopathic uh, treatments. None of them really going to work, but people ask you and they want you to be up on that, so you should be, know that there is a list of things that people talk about online, and it describes each one, and we'll put, put that on our website too, under the four vets section, so that you ha can go to that later, just because people always ask those questions, you're like, where am I going to find that information? So we'll have that there for you. Um, and then we're going to talk about our workup for I-131 therapy why we ask you to do the things that we do, and then the treatment and the thyroid to background ratio, and we actually have this guarantee that we do, and I'll explain to you why do that, and then post-treatment, what the owners are to expect and what you're going to see with the cats and what you really want to look for, okay? So to start out, hyperthyroidism is the most common endocrine disease since the 70s. It's actually on the rise. Prior to the 70s, it was pretty uncommon. So they're, look, they're still trying to figure out what the factor is, why it's been rising, but it is rising. And so one out of every 300 cats or so gets hyperthyroidism. They've looked at breed relation. They haven't found that. There's no sex predisposition. But for those that are online, there are two breeds. That's going to be nice and annoying right there. There are two breeds. Which two breeds are less likely to develop hyperthyroidism? So that should come up on your phones there. And the choices are one, Siamese and Himalayan, two, Sphinx and Bengal, three, Persian and Ragdoll, four, Rex and Russian Blue. Now these are the ones that are unlikely to get hyperthyroidism. They almost have a, a protective effect as a breed. So the Siamese and Himalayan and Sphinx and so I'll, So as we're going through, so clearly the Siamese and Himalayan is the favorite on this, and it actually is correct. So you all know your breeds. All right. So what they found in this is they looked at this over the last 30 years and what's going on, and the result is, and it's interesting because it's bilateral disease, yet it's over-functioning tissue follicular tissue in the thyroid itself, not being stimulated from anything outside. So for some reason, one's doing it, they're not connected. The thyroids and cats aren't connected, yet you'll have two lobes a lot of times 
it's most commonly to be bilateral, two lobes with over-functioning tissue, and it's actually at the uh, cyclic AMP level. And they don't understand why that's happening. So um, it's, they started looking at uh, exogenous causes, that wasn't it. And there are two species that have spontaneous hyperthyroidism. One is, that is gonna be good. <laughs> So which two species suffer from spontaneous hyperthyroidism? Clearly the cat, since we're here. <laughs> so the cat and manatee, because I've seen a lot of thin manatees. <laughs> cat and the horse, cat and dog, and the cat and the human. So go ahead and... Now there were eight people that voted the first time. Come on now. Yep. That's all right. We'll move on then. I don't want to keep it going here. So it is. It's cat and human. All right. So the thing about it is that they first started out thinking it was Graves' disease and people, like Graves' disease from people. Graves' disease is actually immunoglobulin that gets in there and then stimulates the formation of T4. It's not what's going on at all. It's actually in the follicular cell, so it's not like Graves' disease. All right? But they did look at predisposing factors going on here, and it's interesting the things they came up with. Litter usage, three times more likely association with hyperthyroidism. Have you all heard about the canned food thing and the fish? And that one being two times more likely. They think that there's something associated with canned food in there that's causing these, these cats to develop hyperthyroidism. None of these have been proven. And if you look at every bit of literature, they still say we don't know. Then their use of pesticides or topical ectoparasite treatments, they think that that's the association. Then recently it's come up with flame retardants being a cause or even soy products. So these are all possibilities, but they just don't know. The bottom line is... You would ask that. You love the fire, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Don't the flame retardant actually is in the different uh, in the household, uh, pillows, things like that, uh, mattress. It's it's all over the and so they're getting an exposure to it. Yeah. Is there a certain litter that is more clay versus pumping versus silicone in the litter usage? That was not talked about. So I don't have that answer. I don't know, but it wasn't discussed. The litter with the canned food and flame retardant mixed in <laughs> does have the higher incidence. Guaranteed. Yes. Soy with soy base. Thank you. So the disease. I mean, everyone knows the disease. It's weight loss, hyperactivity, increased appetite, thirst, vomiting, diarrhea, tachycardia, arrhythmia. This one I want to talk about, the hypertension. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to come back to that that's interesting but they do have hypertension associated with it but there also is the apathetic hyperthyroidism where they actually so you have a cat high t4 it's depressed it's not eating you're like this cat doesn't really fit there's a percentage of them that actually have apathetic hyperthyroidism and so the question becomes you know what percentage really in the literature <laughs> what percentage in the literature are apathetic hyperthyroid cats. So is it 10%, 1%, 5%, 20% of your cats that you see that are hyperthyroid are actually depressed and anorexic, or 15%? So somewhere, it looks like somewhere between 5 and 15%. So people are thinking 5%, because you don't see many of these. And the literature states that it's actually going to be 10% of the cats in there. So one out of every 10 hyperthyroid cats, if you're going, you're scratching your head going, why is this cat not acting like a hyperthyroid? If you saw nine others that, in that year, that might be your apathetic one. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. I didn't see any uh, organization as a factor also involved in hyperthyroid cats. What was it? Vocal, higher vocalization. Yeah, they're definitely vocalized. They go to cool areas. I didn't want to put everything down there. I mean, but yes, absolutely. They'll seek out cold places. They're just overactive. The whole thing. You're absolutely right. 
So then there's also the thyroid carcinoma ones. We always talk about it. They have adenomatous hyperplasia or adenoma, benign condition, but we do see some that have thyroid carcinoma. So it's always good to kind of know what, we're not gonna get the latest version. It's gonna really mess things up, I know it. A, you should kind of know how many of these are carcinomas because it's gotta pop into the owner's head, well, is my cat gonna die from this? Because carcinoma has a much worse prognosis. And in fact, the carcinomas, it's more, if you feel the bigger masses, the really high T4s, that is the indication that they're carcinomas, all right? So of these, what percent do you think are thyroid carcinomas? 20 to 30, 10 to 20, 5 to 10, 70 to 80, 1 to 2. What is that? There was a show, Vote Now. Dancing with the Stars? Call in now. <laughs> 866. <laughs> Dial in. Point number eight. Okay, so got a broad range there. So um, it's actually a very low number in this, in terms of being that one to two percent of these cats. So the treatment, the prognosis of it, is really quite good. The when they're going to have carcinoma, the prognosis is a lot worse. So if you start feeling those really big ones, you might have one of this one or two out of a hundred. And you need to, a lot of times, and let me tell you about this. If you have a cat that has a thyroid carcinoma and some renal disease, and it turns out on a thyroid scan to be all over the place, I'm gonna recommend that you get that surgically debulked and treat that cat because that, that carcinoma, you cannot treat. It's gonna spread versus renal disease, you can treat that afterwards. So you wanna kill that tumor. That's gonna be pretty aggressive, all right? So, the heart. <clears throat> yeah. In thyroid carcinoma in cats, what, what's the lifespan left uh, uh, considered uh, when there's no treatment involved? If they let the cancer run involved? I'm going to have to get back to you on that because I know that the lifespan with treatment is about a year, but I don't know in terms of without, and I will get you the numbers on if it's local. If it's meted, I will get you those. So afterwards, give me your info. I will let you know. Anyone else that wants that, just uh, tell me afterwards. I'll put up a little sheet or something for that that wants to know. So I don't know that number. I'll get it for you. <clears throat>